Welcome to Modern Anarchy, the podcast exploring sex, relationships, and liberation. I'm your host, Nicole. On today's episode, I will be walking you through my book, The Psychedelic Jealousy Guide, Building Secure, Non-Monogamous, and Expansive Relationships. Together we talk about grounding in your body, exploring your set and setting, and connecting to your intention for expansive relating. Hello, dear listener, and welcome back to Modern Anarchy. I am so delighted to have all of you pleasure activists from around the world tuning in for another episode each Wednesday. My name is Nicole. I am a sex and relationship psychotherapist with training in psychedelic integration therapy, and I am also the founder of The Pleasure Practice supporting individuals in crafting expansive sex lives and intimate relationships. Dear listener, (laughs) wow, this book, I am so excited to be sharing it with you. Dear listener, what made me write this? That's That's a good question. Uh, you know what? All those people that say, I don't experience jealousy, you know what? I just can't relate to them. I have experienced jealousy all the time. Dear listener, I have cried, I have struggled, I have been scared, and I am still scared, right? Relationships are still unfolding. Uh, but you know what? I, I wrote something for myself for my younger self, and for all of you to read, and for all of my clients, right, to ground us in all of these moments, because relationships, what a trip, right? Finding that security in yourself, finding that security in your community of people that love you and cherish you, that is a lifelong journey. I just remember years ago, uh, first starting to practice non-monogamy and just feeling so many emotions. And I would come to my podcast player and I would search, how do I deal with jealousy? And uh, nothing came up. So (laughs) as an answer to my younger self, as an answer to all of my clients, as an answer to all of you dear listeners, here is my book, the psychedelic jealousy guide and it is short it is sweet you can listen to it in a single setting you can read it in a single setting but i really feel like the best way to go through this is to get out a piece of paper and a pen and i am going to ask you hundreds of questions in this book okay you want to deal with jealousy i want to invite you to actually pause the recording as i go through it okay When I ask you questions, pause, reflect, write on your experience. Sometimes I listen to the Psychedelic Jealousy Guide in all of its entirety. There is benefit to that, but also to really slow down and answer these questions will change your experience. I can promise you that. And dear listener, please know that this book is available for free on my website. You can read it on your phone. You can read it on your desktop. It is there. That is one of my important values as I continue to move through this journey of helping other people is to keep content free and accessible to all people. Thank you, my Patreon supporters. You are why I can do this. And yeah, I really hope that you enjoy it. And dear listener, if you're struggling with jealousy, just, hey, I see you. You're not alone. And you know what? I will promise you that it does get better. I am living proof of that in my own world, and it does get better. And I can also promise you that this is not the only resource I will make for you. So I hope you can stay tuned. 
All right, dear listener, if you are ready to liberate your pleasure, you can explore my offerings at modernanarchypodcast.com, linked in the show notes below. And I also want to say the biggest thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. You are supporting the long-term sustainability of the podcast, keeping this content free and accessible to all people. So thank you. If you want to join the Patreon community, get exclusive access into my research and personal exploration, then you can head on over to patreon.com slash modernanarchypodcast also linked in the show notes below. And with that, dear listener, please know that I am sending you all my love and let's tune in to today's episode. The Psychedelic Jealousy Guide, Crafting Secure, Non-Monogamous, and Expansive Relationships. Chapter 1. Explore somatic response. You're having a beautiful day living into your pleasure. And then you hear that your lover has explored some new romantic connection or erotic experience with another person. Suddenly, you notice a shift in your body. A knot in your stomach begins to form. Your heart starts to race. Your breath may feel heavier. And your body becomes tense. Your sympathetic nervous system has kicked into high gear, initiating your body's instinctive fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response to protect you from perceived danger. Despite joyfully committing to a non-monogamous relationship style, you experience a significant wave of somatic or bodily feelings leaving you confused as to how your value systems and the experience of practicing them can be so drastically different. The stress response hormones, adrenaline, and cortisol are flowing through your body and impairing your thinking. You are left wondering, will practicing expansive love always produce such dread? I have personally been here more than once, truly, dear listener, way more than once, and it does get better. Regardless of which relationship style you practice, all of us have experienced moments of jealousy in our relationships. But why, though? Our Western culture's colonizer narratives of sex and relationships have established monogamy as the only relational practice of security, true love, and purity. This has conditioned all of us to understand exclusivity as safety. We call this bias mononormative thinking. Transitioning out of this thinking requires a rather psychedelic paradigm shift. Hearing that your lover explored something new with another individual challenges this classically conditioned narrative and can set off feelings of fear and insecurity within milliseconds. In that time, the brain has responded to this perceived threat by activating its amygdala and the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response. This response decreases the activity of your prefrontal cortex, which is used for rational thinking and decision-making. With the ability to think rationally, compromised, it's best to avoid trying to intellectualize these feelings. Did you hear that, dear listener? Let's not intellectualize these feelings. I always fall into that camp. I'm just going to think about this enough until I feel okay. But remember, your rationality is compromised. Instead, first focus on regulating the body through the practice below. This practice will help your body to feel safe again and engage your mind's ability to think rationally through bottom-up processing using somatic grounding techniques like breathing to influence the brain. As you practice, remember to have compassion for yourself. While the initial conditioned somatic response may feel automatic, you are in control of how you respond to this experience moving forward. This is the first step 
of finding grounding in any psychedelic paradigm shift. Try having an observer's mindset and curiously exploring your psychological and somatic experience without judgment. Jealousy, like any emotion, is a moment in time that will pass like all other moments. All right, dear listener, now I'm going to walk you through my acronym CALM. This is going to help support your body to relax, come back to your prefrontal cortex so you can think clearly and rationally, and help you to ground. So the first letter in the CALM acronym is C, which stands for CENTER. So you're going to center yourself with deep breathing. I'm going to invite you to bring your attention to your breath. Notice the sensation of air entering and leaving the body. Just observe it as it naturally occurs. Now take a deep inhale breath through the nose and allow your belly to fill up with air. Then slowly release the exhale out through the mouth. Repeat this breath, noticing your body relax as you activate your parasympathetic nervous system. This is your rest and digest system of regulation. Feeling more safe and secure with each round of breath. The next letter in the CALM acronym is A. So you are going to assess your sensory experience. So to ground back in the here and the now of this present moment, you can try connecting with your five senses. So first, take a moment to identify five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. Again, if you need to pause the recording to take your time, I definitely want to invite you to do that as you move through this practice. Once you have connected with your five senses, I'm going to invite you to continue to assess your body. So you're going to start from the top of your head and then slowly scan down. Just check in each part of the body take a moment to observe any sensations that are standing out for you without analyzing or judging them and really take that scan fully from the top of your head all the way to the toes The next letter in the CALM acronym is L, which stands for let go of tension and ruminating thoughts. So sometimes we will hold tension between the eyebrows or the jaw, the shoulders or the hips. I'm definitely one personally to hold it really high in my shoulders. My shoulders will come up by my ears. So definitely check in with that one if you're like me. We're going to take a moment to release any tension through a deep exhale. Finding more peace and relaxation. So let's take that breath. (sighs) Try intentionally squeezing your muscles to build tension for five to 10 seconds, and then releasing to feel deeper relaxation. 
So this is progressive muscle relaxation. So you can try squeezing your fist, you can try squeezing your calves, your thighs, right? Any area of the body where you can literally squeeze and build up that tension and then relax and let it go and feel that release. You can also ask for a hug. Place your hand firmly on the center of your chest and gently apply pressure. Or use a weighted blanket to benefit from the grounding of compression. You can also take a moment to pet any of your cats or dogs that may be around you. I have Fat Cat here right now by the recording and it can always be really grounding and activated moments just to again connect with the five senses and be able to hi fat cat <laughs> and be able to uh, connect with your pets again to let go of the tension and the ruminating thoughts and you know what also helps to really let go of tension and release feel-good endorphins a delicious expansive orgasm so i would invite you to also explore potentially having that full body release through an orgasm to quiet the mind and let go of some of those ruminating thought patterns you can try counting your breath with the inhale as one and the exhale out as two and then you'll keep counting up inhale three Exhale four. <sighs> Inhale five. Right, and you're gonna continue to keep counting your way up to 10 or longer to really relax the mind and help the body through deep breathing. It's a really great meditation, right? Your mind is focused on the breath and the counting and that usually for me helps to quiet some of the thoughts. And singing can also help to regulate your breathing and let go of ruminating thoughts. There have been so many different days where I've been stressed and I can feel it in my chest and I will just blast some music in the car and really allow myself to fully sing. I am not a singer, y'all, but I just give it my best shot. And that really helps to regulate my breathing and help my body to release some of that stress too. And in the Jealousy Guide online, if you are reading it online, I do have a link to one of my favorite non-monogamy songs here. And then finally, the last letter in the CALM acronym is M, which stands for move. So you're going to move energy through the body. So find movement that helps your body release emotional energy. Try going for a walk outdoors shaking your body, running, stretching, or dancing to release some of those feel-good endorphins that are going to counterbalance stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. So really, listen to your body and explore movement practices that feel intuitive to you. Move in ways that feel pleasurable and nourishing without judgment. So dear listener, I hope you can pause and really connect with your body Hey, I have definitely been there in the past where a very stubborn and cognitive version of myself would have said, why do I need any of this dumb body stuff? This is silly. I can just think my way through this stress. And if that's where you are at, then this section is especially for you because no matter how smart you are, how many frames you can think of to non-monogamy, the reality is that when you are activated, your prefrontal cortex is no longer at its max capacity. You are in a different part of your brain, right? The fight, flight, freeze, your amygdala is activated. And so your thinking skills are impaired. So the first thing we have to do is work with the body. So again, if you are that person that says, why the body? This is especially for you. When you hear a difficult new piece of non-monogamy, the first thing that we want to do is check in with our body and try to regulate. Again, sometimes even when my partner shares something, I will have that reaction, notice it, and they'll say, how are you feeling? And before I even try to make meaning of how I am cognitively feeling, 
I will just tell them, oh, I'm noticing that I'm feeling this tightness in the chest or I'm feeling this funny feeling in my stomach or I'm feeling really activated like I need to run out of here and leave, right? So just be with your body. You don't have to be attached to any sort of narratives of what the response means, but rather we're gonna have that compassion. We're gonna practice the CALM acronym, right? Working through these different somatic pieces so that way we can come back to our full rational thinking. All right, so now chapter two. Examine your set and setting the framework of the psychedelic paradigm shift. If you are new to the psychedelic world, we often talk about set and setting, right? This is what makes or breaks your psychedelic experience. And so your set refers to the mindset, the narratives, and the emotional state, whereas the setting refers to your relational environment and context, all the external pieces, right? So when you hear set, think internal. And when you hear setting, you can think external. So in this chapter, first, we're going to go through your mindset. And as I go through these different points of mindset, I want you again, dear listener, to pause, reflect, journal. We can read through this whole psychedelic jealousy guide quickly But there's so much more depth to this practice if you pull out some paper, if you spend some time to really sit with these questions. So again, I want to invite you to pause this audiobook wherever you need to, okay? So the first one is narratives of connection. So take a moment and reflect on the narratives of sex and relationships that have impacted you. What messages did you receive about secure relationships? Was there a specific relationship practice that was emphasized as the right way? So, for example, in my own life, I grew up in a conservative Christian culture in America. And this culture taught me that healthy relationships are only between a man and a woman and were specifically monogamous, maintaining your virginity until you are married to one sexual partner for life. True love is therefore only monogamous and exclusive. So when my first polyamorous partner presented the idea of non-monogamy and expansive relating, I firmly exclaimed, if you really loved me, you would only want to be with me. I completely misunderstood at the time how we all have multiple relationships and love multiple people, regardless of which relationship style you practice. That love often takes different forms of platonic, romantic, or sexual connection, depending on your relationship style. I had to learn that you are not quote-unquote less pure by having sex with multiple people, And in fact, erotic and sexual connection is an art. And like any art, you learn and gain skill with more continued practice and diverse exploration. Another example under narratives of connection. Stories of romance taught me that only monogamous relationships are secure and last. My lover's exploration with someone else means my life will be chaotic and unpredictable, and I will always struggle with jealousy. Change is the only constant. All of our relationships are unpredictable and will change over the years, hopefully for the better. Monogamous marriages currently have a divorce rate of around 50%, although this changes drastically depending on someone's socioeconomic status. While relationship satisfaction may be strong, individuals in long-term monogamous relationships often struggle to maintain erotic desire, with many monogamous relationships experiencing sexual or romantic infidelity. People who practice non-monogamy and expansive relating often find security through direct conversations about these realities and designing unique commitments that are not predicated upon exclusivity of actions. 
In fact, polyamorous relationships reported both higher levels of relationship satisfaction and sexual fulfillment than monogamous relationships. Long-term security in expansive relationships is possible through continued conversation and commitment of time and energy. Even after finding security in your relationship and your partner's multiple partners, you may still feel fear and jealousy when they develop a new dynamic. I've been there. I continue to have this. (laughs) A new relationship, even after establishing multiple, does introduce change into the system, and that can be scary. When our non-exclusive platonic relationships build new connections, there is the possibility that may change their time, their energy for our relationship. Find security in trusting the unique and irreplaceable gift that is your connection, and their freedom to continue choosing to share their life with you. Feelings of jealousy do get easier to navigate through continued practice and development of consistent security. Number two, narratives of self. So what messages did you receive about your value and self-worth in relationships? Are you more threatened by your partner connecting with someone of your gender? What new narratives would you like to focus on moving forward? For example, stories of romance taught me that I should fulfill all of my lover's sexual and romantic needs. If I cannot fulfill their needs, there is something wrong with me. The reality is, no single relationship can fulfill all of your needs, desires, or fantasies in a lifetime. We easily understand how diverse platonic connections reflect different aspects of ourself and bring more perspective into our lives. We don't presume anything is wrong with ourselves or the relationship when our friends have other friends, right? And yet we struggle to understand, and I struggle too, my brain struggles, it's a classical conditioning. We struggle to understand how romantic and sexual diversity will also improve the quality of our relationships. Sexually, we all have our own erotic narratives, and it is impossible that any single person would have all of the exact same fantasies and desires. Diversity of experience allows us to explore the multifaceted aspects of ourselves and can bring us deeper gratitude for the unique connection of each relationship. Now, my gosh, I resonate with this part. This can be so incredibly easy to feel as you build your own relationships with multiple people, but much harder to remember when your partner builds other relationships. Dear listener, I'm over here with all these partners, right? And I love them all individually. They're so beautiful. They're all so important, right? But the second your partner has someone else, whoa, why is it so different? We, of course, have a secure relationship with ourselves, but it can be difficult to feel secure in our relationship with others. So do your best to remember how you can still uniquely love all of your partners and apply that same frame to your partner's experience. Another example of narratives of self are... Stories of romance taught me that the only way I can feel important, sacred, or special is through exclusivity of action. I no longer feel special because my partner is exploring sexual and romantic connections with others. How is it that we find importance and a sense of specialness in our non-exclusive platonic relationships? We find that security and sacredness through our friends' continued commitment of time and energy, remembering that no other relationship can provide the unique connection that you bring. So there is no competition. You are important, sacred, and special through your own individuality and the relationship you have built. Both you and your partner have all of the freedom in the world to build expansive relationships 
and you continue to choose one another. Can you feel how powerful that is? Number three, emotional state. So take a moment and reflect on how your current emotional state may be impacting your experience of jealousy. Are you already currently hungry, tired, or stressed out? Are you exploring altered states of consciousness through drugs? So for example, when I am stressed out or tired, my nervous system is already activated and tender to increased stressors. When you're experiencing low blood sugar from hunger, that will impair your ability to think clearly. In these states, hearing new details about a lover's exploration can feel exceptionally overwhelming. It can often start a spiral of thoughts, been here, I can't do this, I'm not good at non-monogamy, this will never get easier. My lover is not going to have enough time or energy for me, and my lover is going to leave me. (laughs) Notice the beginning of a slippery slope of negative, all-or-nothing thinking, right? And when this would happen to me, it was split seconds. I would have a whole chain of thoughts in just like microseconds. They're going to leave me. It's, oh my god, what what is happening? Oh my god, right? (laughs) Um... So before discussing new details with the partner that may be triggering, uh, try checking in with them to see if both of you have enough time and emotional space to process. Don't just drop those new details on them, especially if you're new to the dynamic. There may be a time where your partner comes back and says, oh, I had this amazing date, or oh, I met my partner's family, or oh, whatever it is. But that is often built through multiple experiences of talking about it and feeling safe. So especially if you're new to this, try checking in to see if both of you have had ample sleep and food to create the most grounded somatic state and mindset possible. Hearing that my partner had explored a new connection 30 minutes before a podcast recording over the phone when I was by myself at home was not an ideal time to drop that information. Uh, I lived, learned, and had to reschedule that recording. Oh, dear listener, when I think back on that, I like truly fell to the floor and I was just like, oh my God, I was not ready to hear this. And I started crying and I had to cancel that podcast recording. And it's funny now because if my partner called me and told me about this information now, I wouldn't have had this reaction, but we were new and it was the beginning of it. And so it's just important to make sure that you're checking in with your partners. Now I ask for partners to share new information when we have ample space to discuss these changes, not 30 minutes before a podcast recording. I do love my partner who did that. We we live and we learn. Um, I also ask that we discuss these details when we are physically together and can hold hands for somatic grounding when possible. There's so much nervous system grounding when you can be held, when you can see that person, right, rather than getting that information through a text or a phone call. Of course, if you have to and the requirements are there, then that makes sense to be able to call or to text. But when possible, grounding in person can be so, so helpful. And drugs also impact our ability to process jealousy. I ask that my partners not introduce new dynamics while we are in altered states of consciousness from drugs without prior explicit and enthusiastic consent in our ordinary states of consciousness. Y'all, no one wants to be on a psychedelic when you're in an altered state of consciousness where your attachment is already heightened and your sensations are heightened. You know what that also means? Jealousy is gonna be heightened. Lived, learned, also been there. And so (laughs) um, when I go to explore and play in those altered states of consciousness, I will talk to my partners about not introducing new play with other people or sharing new details unless we have specifically stated that that's what we're doing with this experience. All right, number four, parts. So take a moment and reflect on the various parts or aspects of your psyche that can impact jealousy. What are your different parts saying? What are they craving for security and grounding? Can you mediate a conversation between your conflicting parts? 
Now, if you know IFS theory, this is what's coming in here, concepts of parts of yourself. And if you're new to parts work, that's okay. I'm gonna give you some examples here to walk you through it. So, for example, our minds contain multitudes. Sometimes our thoughts and perspectives directly contradict each other. Oh, as I watched my partner explore erotic connections with others for the first time, there was a part of me that screamed, let me tell you, dear listener, screamed very loudly, they're going to leave you, non-monogamy never works, you should just give up now and walk away. <laughs> and there was also a part of me that said, how exciting that my partner is enjoying the expansiveness of connection and pleasure. I know I'm secure and I'm so happy for them. In the moment, the terrified part of me was screaming much louder than the other, making it almost impossible to hear the more grounded and secure part of myself. So consider your experiences of jealousy and identify which parts are present. Naming these parts can help to create some space of non-attachment to these thoughts. Maybe you have a monogamous part that will speak, maybe a non-monogamous part. Maybe you have an inner child part that is tender and scared. Maybe you have a brave part that believes in the liberation of love. While you may feel a values-based desire to align with certain parts, I want to invite you to have compassion and curiosity as you honor the fears and needs of your seemingly less than ideal parts. Ultimately, they are speaking to something that is important to you. As you listen, consider what do these different parts need? What are they afraid of? What do they want? How old is this part? Why was it created? What would these parts say to each other? And as you're in this reflection process, please remember that you are not your thoughts or the various parts that are speaking. You are able to curiously listen to all these parts and then decide how you would like to proceed. That is such a big piece of this jealousy guide. Again, of course, we start with the somatic and the work with the body so that we can regulate and ground. And then once you're here, it is non-attachment to those thoughts that are coming up. Remember, we have been impacted by years of deep classical conditioning. And so my monogamous part that was tender and afraid would say, this can never happen. This is just going to blow up. They're going to run away. Oh my gosh, right? And then that small, quieter voice, the liberation, the part of me that believed in my feminist calling to explore this was so much quieter. And so I had to take a step back and honor what the monogamous part of me wanted, which was security, right? Reliability in my relationships. And all of that makes sense right? And then to also take that step back and reground in my values, which we'll get to later. All right, number five, relationship to self. So take a moment and reflect on how your relationship with yourself can impact jealousy. This is a big one. So how do I talk to myself in my mind? Are my inner thoughts generally kind and empowering or critical and harsh? Can I identify both my strengths and growing edges without judgment? For example, during my first group play experience, oh yes, I watched my partner lovingly caress the hands of another woman, dear listener. And can we just underline that for a moment? My partner lovingly caressed the hands of another woman. He was holding hands with her as he was also holding hands with me and she was holding hands with me. We crossed all of our hands together, which is actually really cute. But when he was interlacing his fingers with her, he was rubbing his thumb on her hand. And dear listener, my first time having that, I lost my shit. I absolutely lost it. In that moment, a complex flood of negative thoughts came over me. This is where my brain was going. She is way prettier than I am. My partner is absolutely going to leave me for her because she is way more interesting and amazing than I am. She is the shiny new relationship and I am just the old leftovers that are no longer exciting. 
truly had this from just him touching her hand. <laughs> Finding security in moments of jealousy can be exceptionally difficult if you have a negative relationship to yourself and your self-worth. The psychedelic community often describes psychedelic drugs as non-specific amplifiers. Expansive relationship styles can similarly amplify your feelings of relational dynamics, including your relationship to yourself. Again, rather than attaching or identifying with these first reactions, take a moment to ground in your body, a couple of deep breaths, and remember that you are the author of your story. We get to practice curiously noticing and observing these thoughts. Remember that we are not defined by these initial reactions, but rather by the way we respond to them moving forward. In that moment, I had to remind myself, I am beautiful, I am worthy, my partner is not going to abandon me. And notice if these grounding affirmations come from a space of competition. We want to check in if our affirmations are, I'm prettier than her, I'm smarter than her, right? How can we flip it to, I am beautiful, I am worthy. Rather than finding strength in being better than someone, instead focus on how you are both beautiful beings. You are incredibly unique and no one else can be you. There is no competition to win. So it's important that we're able to provide ourselves these affirmations and we can ask for affirmations from our lovers in moments of doubt. It is all about finding that balance between internal self-affirmation and external affirmation from others. In the balance of both, we find our interdependence rather than codependence or hyperindependence. How can you continue to practice loving yourself? What new narratives about yourself do you want to write as you continue to grow? It can be helpful to share these initial reactions with a trusted lover or partner who can practice providing a non-judgmental space for you to process these thoughts. Often I will say, hey, I am noticing these initial thoughts are coming up. I'm not attached to them and I'm trying to get curious about them. Can I share some of them with you? And usually my partner will be like, yes, I'd love to hear them. And naming these thoughts without attachment to them often helps to loosen their power over us. Number six, relationship to challenges. So take a moment and reflect on how your relationship to challenges can impact jealousy. So what emotions do you experience when you are confronted with a difficult situation? How do you respond to these emotions? Can you recall a recent challenge you faced? How did you approach it? So for example, the saying goes, how you do one thing is how you do everything. Reflect on how your patterns when facing challenges could be present in your navigation of expansive relating. For me, I tend to oscillate between feeling like I am strong enough to take on any challenge Sure, I can go to the play party and watch you build an erotic connection with others. I'm totally fine. And dear listener, I definitely cried that night for sure. <laughs> well, that is no longer a challenge today, it certainly was in the beginning. I often tried to push myself through it too quickly to quote unquote rip the bandaid off. Or I start to feel like I am too weak to keep going. I should just quit this now. There is no way I'm ever going to feel secure. Today, I am so deeply grateful that I continue to slowly explore and not attach to these thoughts. So in terms of that quote of how you do one thing is how you do everything, when I am feeling confident, I might push myself to move faster than my body is prepared for and override my instincts to slow down to appear strong and resilient. That is totally me with the play party example, right? Hey, I'm fine. I can do this, right? (laughs) Let's just run through the gate. I'm fine. I don't need a break. Um, When I'm feeling weak, I often fall into all or nothing thinking that catastrophizes the story more than the actual reality. Oh, how long do I have to learn that lesson, dear listener? Damn. I notice that similar patterns of thought are often present in my rock climbing practice. Of course, I can totally lead this complicated route even though I am exhausted at the end of a session. What is rest? Who needs that? (laughs) 
or I will experience negative thoughts while climbing. There's no way you're going to reach that next hold. You should just stop climbing now. This is way too scary. Do you notice any consistent patterns in your embrace of challenge? When climbing, I pause and I take a deep breath to remember that I am not attached to these thoughts of fear. How can you bring more curiosity into your thought process and practice mindfulness to take some distance from these initial reactions? Remember, you are the narrative of your own story and can choose how you would like to respond. And remember that this is a challenge by choice. No one is requiring you to do this. This is something that you are choosing. And often even that paradigm shift can help it to feel more empowering rather than a cage that you're locked in. All right, dear listener. So that is the mindset. Reflecting on those various narratives that may be impacting your internal experience of jealousy. And now we're going to explore your setting. So number one, the relationship So take a moment and reflect on how your relationship may be impacting your experience. How do you currently feel about your relationship? Has this person demonstrated that they are considering your experience and doing their best to communicate with you? So for example, when you are only receiving breadcrumbs of affection, the idea of your lover sharing their time and energy with another person can feel incomprehensible. Could you imagine being so hungry and someone gives you crumbs and then they say, I'm actually going to share these crumbs also with the person sitting next to you. You would flip, right? Or if you ask your partner to demonstrate their affection and they continue to struggle to meet these requests, but then you see them provide that affection to someone else, of course you are going to feel jealous. So love is abundant but time and energy are not. Examine how much of your experience of jealousy may be an indication of unmet desires for time and energy. So after my mother gave birth to my younger sister, she tried to reassure me that there would still be time and energy for our relationship. The story goes that I screamed and yelled, put that baby back in your belly. I don't want to share. Since then, I have learned to see the beautiful joy of multiple familial relationships and sharing time and space. And we understand how parents can uniquely love multiple children. However, there is a finite limit to this, right? This is what Jessica Fern and I were talking about in the last episode. Four, six, eight, ten children later? Our capacity to love is infinite, But our ability to share that love through time and energy is limited due to our finiteness as humans. So what do you desire in terms of time and energy from your partners? Learning to separate feelings of jealousy between perceived threats of narrative security, right? The, I need to meet all their needs, or I'm not enough, etc. versus an actual loss of time and energy will make it easier to identify and express what you need in your relationships to feel secure. So one helpful way to identify the difference is asking yourself, would I feel the same level of jealousy if they were spending that time with their friends, children, or other family members? Another example of how the relationship may be impacting your experience of jealousy is... There is no amount of somatic regulation and grounded mindset that can compensate for poor communication and a lack of empathy or consideration in your relationship. If your partner withholds details or invalidates your experience of jealousy, it will be extremely difficult to feel security and compersion. Your listener, if this is you, please do not beat yourself up for struggling if your partner is withholding details and making it hard to trust them. Oh, So thriving in non-monogamy and expansive relating requires high levels of clear communication, significant empathy, and thorough consideration of how your actions impact others. So... Do take time to examine how much of your experience of jealousy might be due to poor foundational aspects of the relationship. If you've been compensating for your partner's lack of intentionality by saying, quote unquote, 
oh, they just don't have enough time and energy right now. They have a lot going on in their life right now that is preventing them from showing up. <laughs> it can be painfully enlightening to watch them intentionally show up for other relationships. They can start scheduling dates and giving them flowers and all the things that you just thought, oh, they were too busy to do for you. That's going to sting. And of course, you're going to feel jealousy. Is your partner wrapped up in the intense waves of new relationship energy and neglecting your desires for connection? Is it possible to ask your partner to improve in these areas? Can you trust your partner to communicate and consider you in their actions? If so, take a deep breath and try to feel that security of trust in your body. If not, Consider examining if there are poor foundational aspects of the relationship or past relational pains that are making it hard to trust your partner. All right, number two, past relationships. So take a moment and reflect on how your past relationships may be impacting your experience. Have you noticed any reoccurring patterns in your relationships that may stem from past dynamics? How do these patterns influence your current relationship dynamic? So for example, in my first polyamorous relationship, we had agreed to the commitment of informing each other if we had sex with someone else. Dear listener, what a simple agreement, right? Hey, just like, let me know if you end up having sex with someone else. And this was my first time doing it, my first poly relationship. I found out months later that my partner had been having sex with someone and that they had failed to inform me. They also failed to inform the other person about our relationship. Breaking our relationship commitment was an act of cheating in non-monogamy, which ended our relationship shortly after. That was truly my first experience of polyamory. <laughs> I'm much happier in the dynamics I have now, dear listener, let me tell you. After having a difficult psychedelic drug experience, naturally you'll be afraid to try again, right? That makes sense. You get kicked off the horse. Why would you want to ride again, right? Our body and minds are always trying to keep us safe. My experience in my first polyamorous dynamic created a level of paranoia and fear about a lack of communication in future non-monogamous experiences. This fear was healed through a series of extremely secure, non-monogamous relationships that practiced high levels of clear communication. If we have had painful experiences in the past, we will try to anticipate and prevent getting hurt in the future. Those are those ruminating thoughts that are going to come up. Of course, this is happening. They're going to, right, like fill in the blank based on your past. So take time to examine how past experiences of non-monogamous or even monogamous relationships can be impacting your experience of jealousy. Another example of how relationships can impact you is if your parents or past relationships abandoned you and left your needs unmet. So jealousy may trigger old wounds and relational patterns. Or if your parents or past relationships fail to validate your emotions and co-regulate with you, you may feel like you have to hide your experience of jealousy. And of course, this is particularly salient for anyone who has been socially conditioned to be hyper-independent or to feel like expressing emotions is a weakness. So try practicing compassionate curiosity. Get curious about the root causes of these feelings. What feels familiar? What feels different? What values do you want to focus on moving forward? Remember that vulnerably expressing your needs for support and security in your community of relationships is a strength. Go watch all the stuff on Brene Brown if you've not seen that, please. It's just so much good content. All right, number three, community. So take a moment and reflect on how your community may be impacting your experience. How does the quality of communication and empathy within your community affect your ability to feel secure in your relationships? How can you expand your community to include more diverse perspectives and supportive relationships? So for example, who can you process your experience of jealousy with? 
What sort of content around relationships are you consuming? So when processing feelings of jealousy, it is absolutely not helpful to be met with, well, I could never do that either. Or that sounds impossible. I found it best to process these experiences with other people who have gone through it and who have found tools to make the psychedelic paradigm shift easier. So reflect on who in your community can be a supportive companion in your navigation of jealousy. Finding content with similar values around expansive relating is crucial in creating a supportive environment to build secure, expansive relationships. Hi, dear listener, if you're listening to this, I'm so happy to be a part of your content community and someone that you trust, so hi. (laughs) All right, another example. When I was practicing monogamy, my only deep intimate relationship was my one romantic and sexual partner. I could not fathom my partner sharing their love with anybody else. (laughs) Even in the beginnings of practicing non-monogamy, I noticed it felt impossible to again comprehend my partner sharing their love with others. As I built multiple secure and intimate relationships, I felt an abundance of love that suddenly made sharing feel less threatening. This makes sense, right, dear listener? We all need love and connection. Love is an essential resource. So when we do not have a full supportive community of deeply fulfilling and intimate relationships, right, of all types, doesn't have to just be sexual or romantic, we will then tightly cling onto our limited sources for survival. If you only had one source of water in a dry desert, how could you ever comprehend sharing your one source of water? Right? It makes sense that if you only have one source of deep love and care and consistency, it is going to be so hard to share that with anybody else. So where can you expand your community of relationships to build more fulfilling experiences of love? How can you reach a full saturation of love? Another example of community, oof, this is the fun one, metamors, right? Your partner's partner. So how are you conceptualizing your metamor? Are you on the same team of creating more love and joy for your shared partner and community? Can you see them as part of your shared community? Examine narratives of competition and scarcity that may be impacting your experience of jealousy. Often our mind can create scarier narratives than reality. Dear listener, that's so true. (laughs) For me, building a friendship with my first metamor helped to ease my fears of jealousy and insecurity. Together we navigated the nerves of a new type of relationship and mood the intention of deep care for each other. To this day, they continue to be one of my closest friends and supporters in my community, y'all. It's so true. This person is no longer dating the shared partner, but we're still in such deep community, and I will always refer to them as my first metamor. And eventually, I'm going to have a metamor-focused podcast episode for you with them down the line so stay tuned for that one now oh my first metamor and continue to this day one of my closest friends is a very different story than my second metamor (laughs) here we go my second metamor ended their relationship with our shared partner after learning that i practice relationship anarchy Ooh, interesting let's spill some more tea Uh, This was an act of discrimination that left me feeling deeply hurt both by my metamor, I cried a lot, and our shared partner who sought to still continue their relationship with this individual. Ooh. (laughs) Yes, dear listener, just imagine how I was feeling. In a dynamic where you feel judged and discriminated against for your identity, practices, or value system, Naturally, feelings of jealousy and discomfort will be amplified due to a poor setting from the lack of emotional safety. Genuine respect and care for the well-being of another individual is the bare minimum of platonic relationships in a community and is certainly necessary to navigate the added complexities of multiple romantic and sexual relationships. 
The same individual later asked our shared partner, is it important to you that I like Nicole? Learning about this question really struck me. Were a platonic friend to ask, is it important that I like your partner? We would be baffled that a baseline of respect and care for one of your meaningful relationships needs to be questioned at all, right? Could you imagine one of your friends saying, hey, is it important to you that I, that I like your partner? <laughs> You'd say, what do you mean? If you really meant that, you probably should have kept that question to yourself, right? <laughs> like what? Respect. It's all about respect and care, right? And yet in the world of romance and sexuality, there is a level of animosity, competition, and hostility for other partners that needs to be examined for its deeper roots of insecurity. All right, (laughs) Can, can you address these dynamics directly in your metamor relationship? How can your shared partner facilitate the establishment of safety and community care? Is your partner respecting you and your needs for emotional safety within the community when building new connections? Evaluating these two drastically different metamor relationships really help to illuminate the significant impact of the setting for the experience of jealousy, right? My metamor number one, we looked at each other saying, I don't know how to do this relationship thing as metamors, but we're going to figure it out, right? We supported each other in our expansion versus metamor number two really struggling to even appreciate me or wanting to be in a shared relationship since I practice relationship anarchy. It was messy. (laughs) So dear listener, that really impacted me and it is such a highlight of the setting of the impact of the psychedelic. So find the loving and expansive community that helps you shine. Now, There's a whole book that could be written on metamors in this experience, but you may also encounter metamors who are eager to grow in their practice of expansive relating, but are struggling with feelings of insecurity and jealousy. How can you practice finding compassion and empathy for their journey? In that practice, you may encounter difficulties with hierarchy if your metamors desire for security consistently restricts and prevents your ability to build a meaningful relationship with your shared partner, right? Say you make weekend plans with your partner, but the other metamor is so stressed out by that that they are crying and needing consistent check-ins and needing consistent support along the way. And obviously, we have compassion, right? We have support and There is a pathway of exposure therapy to these things becoming more ease, right? More safety, more security, right? Well, you can certainly contribute to creating a safe and supportive metamor relationship, right? Being, understanding, all of those pieces, of course, having that empathy. Your metamor sense of security in their relationship with your shared partner or the hinge is outside of your control. The speed at which they build that security is also outside of your control. Now, what is within your control is how you respond to this dynamic, right? So just to remember that you are empowered there, right? That is outside of your control and it may be having an impact on you and you get to choose how you want to respond to that. So some more questions to reflect on that are, Has your metamor demonstrated that they are taking steps towards growth and security? Has your shared partner demonstrated consideration of your desires in their support of your metamor? How can you contribute to your metamor's sense of safety? Is their pace of growth and expansion something you can accept? If not, what does changing your expectations for your relationship or reconfiguring your dynamic look like? So here's a metaphor for you to think about, right? If the sun were too close, it would completely scorch the earth. And were the sun to be too far away, the earth would be too cold to sustain life. So where is that life-giving distance in your relationships, right? You might need to reconfigure if the restraints on the metamor dynamic are impacting you, right? We don't always have to just break up with people. We can maybe reconfigure to take sex and romance off the table or maybe we can't be in such close orbit and we need to take a wider 
frequency, right? Where maybe we see them less often, right? There is a space, again, where the sun is too close or too far. And so where is that life-giving distance in your relationships? All right, dear listener, now we're going to move on to chapter three. Express your desires. Clear and confident communication. So now you're feeling more grounded. We've practiced the calm meditation and connected with our bodies. And we have a better understanding of the various factors, right? So many different factors. You could explore those factors for a lifetime in your sentence setting that may be impacting your experience of jealousy. So now we want to focus on identifying and communicating your desires for continued security. So first... We're going to consider some variables that impact your desires and then identify the desires you would like to share with your partners as you move forward. So I was just talking about orbits, right? The frequency and finding that space in your reconfiguration. So consideration number one is orbits. Imagine your relationships as an expansive solar system. These relationships can orbit you to varying degrees of frequency. You may encounter comet partners that come through your orbit with long intervals of time in between, shooting stars that introduce a momentary blaze of intimacy, or planets and moons that consistently orbit you. So I will use the language closest orbiting partners to describe the relationships where we have a committed once a week date night. Other relationships may orbit at a bi-weekly, monthly, or less frequently scheduled intervals. All of these relationships are important and have a gravitational force, right? So force equals mass, which we can think about that as the importance in your narrative, right? The significance times acceleration, which is the frequency of orbit. How often are you seeing this person, right? So force equals mass, importance, times acceleration, frequency. And the force is attachment and potential feelings of jealousy, right? So the relationships that orbit more frequently, often, but not always, have a greater force of attachment and therefore, potential feelings of jealousy, right? This was such an eye-opener for me in my experience of jealousy is finding how the partners that orbit me at a much faster rate than the people I see once a month, the experience of jealousy is just worlds different, okay? Because the attachment is different. They are both important people, right? They can have similar importance, similar mass, but the acceleration, that frequency of orbit really impacts the force of jealousy. So as such, you may crave different things to ground in moments of jealousy across your varying relationships. It may be easier or harder to hear about your partner's exploration with others based on the frequency of their orbit. For example... There may be more jealousy with a closer orbiting partner than a comet partner due to the stronger gravitational force of attachment. Additionally, you may feel more jealousy when one of your closest orbiting partners connects with their closely orbiting partner rather than a one-time shooting star, right, at a play party, or a comet partner, maybe someone who lives out of town and flies in every now and then and says hello at holidays or other sorts of experiences. So take time to reflect on which desires feel consistent across all types of relationships and which desires are unique to individual connections. And of course, remember that while you have your own expansive solar system, how beautiful, right? You also play a unique role in the solar systems of others. Each of your partners has a whole universe of meaning making and relationships just as much as you do. Number two depth of experience. As I continue to practice expansive relating, my desires during waves of jealousy continue to change and evolve. It's important to remember that there is no elimination of jealousy, but rather the relationship to this experience will shift over time. Things that once brought me to tears now bring sincere compersion, right? That joy for my partner connecting with other partners. Other experiences continue to surprise me with their impact, 
but I now have more tools, community, and insight to work through these moments. Your first psychedelic drug experience can bring significant waves of intense feelings as you navigate a new paradigm. With each trip and a good set and setting, you will continue to learn to adapt and enjoy the ride. This practice does not mean that you can perfectly plan for all future psychedelic journeys or that you will never struggle again, right? People have bad trips on psychedelics even when you've been a psychonaut for multiple trips. It's all about the set and setting, right? Rather, your experience to this experience will shift. Try thinking of expansive relating in a similar way. It is true that you will be more prepared for the trip of jealousy as you gain experience riding the waves of somatic feelings and thought patterns. Despite this experience, it is also true that you may still encounter difficult journeys that will surprise you depending on the set and setting. So have compassion for yourself along the way. While there may always be more growth on the horizon, be sure to also celebrate how far you have come in your journey. Often my clients will continue to beat themselves up for struggling with feelings of jealousy, forgetting to see how much they have already accomplished. So take a moment and reflect. What are some of the things that once made you anxious that no longer have the same impact? Importantly, while it is true that you have learned significant insights from this practice, this does not mean that you are more enlightened than others. Some folks may never try psychedelics, some may try them and happily choose to never take them again, others may really enjoy them, some may choose to explore high doses, and some may only enjoy them at lower doses. Celebrate your own journey of exploration and honor that others will equally be navigating their own journey. Remember, there is no one way to be and experience pleasure in relationships. Now the third and final thing that might impact your needs and desires is shared versus separate experiences. So reflect on how your desires may change depending on if you are sharing expansive experiences in person together or preparing and hearing about them afterwards. Your desires may also shift depending on if the experiences are with a shared community, right? So shared partners, friends, coworkers, etc., or in a separate community space. So it can be helpful to create a flexible game plan to discuss with your lovers for the variety of experiences that may bring up feelings of jealousy. Of course, it is impossible to fully prepare for all the possible experiences, but preparing a loose idea of what support may look like can foster greater feelings of security. So before we go on to identifying your needs and desires for security, I want to take a moment to actually separate out those two words, needs, desires, right? So we all have a need for security and we're going to have different desires for meeting that need of security. We also have a need for love, a need for connection, but no single person is responsible for meeting all of our needs, right? Regardless of which relationship style, we all need love and connection. We all need community. And so no one person will be that person that can meet all of those needs. So we have desires to have those needs met by the people around us, right? That nuanced difference between the two there. So for example, my partners and I have established safer sex practices and consented to the shared risks in our exploration. We practice sexual self-governance, meaning that we do not need to ask each other for permission before engaging in romantic or sexual activity that is within our consented safer sex agreements. The anarchist value of self-governance is always rooted in a deeper understanding of your interconnectedness to your community and collaborating together for the collective good. So within this abundant freedom, we do ask for a check-in before engaging in any romantic or sexual activity with shared community, right? Shared friends, coworkers, partners. Since those actions have bigger ripples for the community as a whole, I definitely wanna check in for my partner, right? That's gonna really impact the system if I find them in a corner 
having a, a beautiful connection moment with one of my friends, right? Now that's impacting one of my dynamics. And so it is definitely something that I would want to have a check-in before, right? Otherwise, there is the freedom and the space to explore abundantly. Now, in a different experience, I was connecting with someone new who expressed a desire that I asked them for permission, right? I send a text asking for permission before I engage in any sexual activity with others. They stated that this was the only way to meet their need for security. Well, of course, I respect their need for security, right? I deeply respect that they need to feel safe. Their desire to have that need met through permission text is incongruent with my current practice of expansive relating, right? Of course, I would certainly be willing to meet their need for sexual safety by informing them after I explore new erotic connections so they can fully consent to any risk that my exploration introduces into our dynamic, right? So I respect their need for sexual safety. I respect their need for emotional safety, but their desire to have that need met through permission text, me having to text them before I connect, would not be consistent with my practice of expansive relating. So we all have different desires for meeting our need of emotional security, and we're going to have different risk ratios, right, for safer sex practices. So how can you communicate with your partners to respect both your needs and then any differences in your respective desires for meeting these needs. It is also important to remember we all have needs for love and connection, but no single person is responsible for meeting all of those needs. Instead, we have desires to meet these needs through multiple relationships, whether that's platonic, sexual, or romantic. Remember, we all have multiple relationships regardless of which relationship style you practice. Most of us just aren't having sex in all those dynamics, right? But we all have multiple relationships. I also want to say here that this distinction between our needs and desires is not an excuse, however, for abuse, harm, or neglect by ignoring our basic needs of respect, consent, and care, to be clear, right? What I want to differentiate between is the way that we desire to have those needs met. We all need respectful, loving connection, but there is an infinite variety of ways for that love to be shared. What are your desires for a loving connection? Because we're all going to have different desires, right? Can you get clear about these desires and communicating them with your lovers? How can these desires be met across your community? While there is a relationship escalator, right? That idea that meaningful relationships must progress from dating to living together and then dying together. There is also an intimacy escalator. Once we start kissing, we must progress to sex. Engaging in sex means we must talk every day and be deeply interconnected, etc., etc. So engaging in these trajectories is not the problem. Rather, we want to examine the presumption that this is the only way to build meaningful relationships and to remember the abundance of ways we can form intimate relationships. Within those problematic assumptions, we often have unstated expectations for relationships that engage in certain acts of sexual or romantic connection. So rather than running with unstated expectations and being hurt when our lovers do not meet them, remember our partners are not mind readers, Take time to clearly communicate your unique desires for a pleasurable connection, which is what we're going to explore next, right? Identifying your desires. So we're going to explore four different pieces to identifying your desires. So the first piece that we're going to explore is timing. While there is no perfect time to discuss new experiences with your partner, There are certainly better and worse times to take the psychedelic, right? Remember, 30 minutes before a podcast recording? Not the best time. Uh, Consider the factors discussed in Chapter 2, Set and Setting. Do both you and your partners have enough time and space to explore new shared experiences or hear about separate adventures? Be sure to check in with each other about your capacity. 
Remember, mind-altering experiences and drugs can make finding security and moments of jealousy exceptionally difficult. Can you find time to discuss new details or explore new experiences during your ordinary states of consciousness? Can you share new details while in each other's physical presence to have the benefits of co-regulation and somatic connection? In terms of identifying your timing, right, here are some questions to consider. When would you like to learn or communicate about new experiences? Truly be as explicit as possible, right? Would you like to know when new flirtatious energy is experienced? Remember, trying to define what is flirtatious energy can be extremely difficult, right? That's a subjective thing. So I want to invite you to be as clear as possible. So I ask that my closest or reading partners communicate with me like they would any friends as new meaningful developments unfold. And then I trust that they will communicate openly and freely. So this allows both myself and my partners the space and autonomy to explore without needing to ask for permission. We, of course, have discussions about safer sex practices and commitments, as well as expectations to check in before engaging in exploration with shared community, right? Partners, coworkers, friends, etc. Otherwise, there's the space to live into the abundance of pleasure and communicate freely about the joys of the exploration. So, would you rather know when a date is scheduled or after erotic activity is explored? Every individual and relationship will navigate this differently. How can you honor your partner's freedom to explore while also feeling secure? Imagine the best case scenario, right? That would build the deepest security and then communicate this with your partners to take steps towards that reality, right? For me, it's, hey, let's talk about this in person when you can hold me just in case I start to cry, right? So... Imagine the best case scenario for you and then communicate that with your partners. The second thing to consider in terms of desires is the dosage, right? So in the psychedelic community, we say start low and slow. You can always take a larger dose later, right? Don't be like me and try to rip the bandaid off. You will cry. (laughs) Take your time adjusting to a new paradigm. How much detail would you like to know? How can you respect both your partner's need for privacy and autonomy while also staying connected? So how would a dose of watching your partner hold hands, snuggle, kiss, connect sexually with someone else feel for you? How would a dose of hearing that your partner has introduced their new lover to their parents or family feel? How would a dose of hearing that your partner is going on vacation with their other partner feel? What dosages bring you excitement? What dosages feel like a stretch? And is there a microdose that feels more accessible? These experiences can obviously be challenging and require stretching to new capacities. So in that stretch, I want to invite you to be aware of your personal edge. We want to stretch, but not tear any muscles. Imagine an ideal exploratory dose of new experiences or hearing new details and then communicate this with your partner. Also, have empathy for individuals who are new to expansive relating. Can you remember the intensity of your first time? These things that are just so simple every day to you might be really intense for someone who is new and who has never done a psychedelic before. So try to have that compassion and empathy and collaboratively discuss how you can support your community with stretching into this new paradigm with exploratory dosing. And then after sharing new information, my partners and I practice asking each other, how is that landing for you? Oof, what a simple question, but wow, it has been really profound. This creates space for us to reflect and share how we are feeling about the evolving dynamic. This practice has truly helped me to feel more secure because I know that my partner is listening and considering how their actions impact me and that there is space for me to be heard in that. Often I will practice naming the various thoughts and somatic responses I am feeling to my partner and remind myself and them that I am not attached or defined by any of these reactions. 
The third thing to consider is aftercare. So dear listener, I want you to get creative. Dream big. What would you long to receive from your partner, your community, and yourself, right? That solo love to feel grounded. Try asking others for the words of affirmations you would like to hear. What words of affirmation can you provide for yourself? Remember that you have done difficult things in the past. Can you recall anything you've learned from those experiences that you want to remember now? Be bold and ask for the quality time you crave. What self-care can you provide for yourself on your solo date nights? Ask for the physical connection that feels supportive. And again, I want to repeat, get creative and dream big, right? You deserve it. You deserve deeply pleasurable relationships. And our partners and community are not mind readers. We have to ask for the things we desire to build that world of pleasure. So imagine a world of your wildest dreams of loving connection being met in abundance. What is the first step towards that dream you can ask for? Also in terms of aftercare, you know, after a psychedelic trip, we can often feel emboldened to make big changes in our life. You know, the classic, I'm going to quit the job and go live on the commune. And it's important to also take time to allow those desires to settle in before acting immediately. So after hearing of your partner's exploration with someone else, you may feel a strong desire to go out and have your own adventure, right? If you did it, well, then I need to go out and do it too, right? Or to swiftly end the relationship dynamic to avoid any potential discomfort. I've definitely been in that space of of hearing some new news and then saying, well, I'm done, I'm out, right? Practice getting curious about the roots of those desires. Trust that you have the time to reflect and then act from a grounded space, right? The meaningful desires that you crave will become clear with time. So we can take all the time that we need. And finally, number four, integration. So as you continue to practice, reflect on what is bringing both you and your community security and pleasure. So what has changed for you and your community? Where is some change needed? Change is the only constant. So ways of relating that once felt secure can start to feel really limiting. And vice versa, right? Commitments that once felt free and expansive can start to feel really chaotically unpredictable. So rather than finding the perfect way of relating, embrace the reality that things will continue to change over time. So we want to learn to flow with these changes and communicate your evolving desires with your lovers. And that is the practice of integration. So take time to reflect on what has changed and what still might need to change for you. And now we have chapter four, embody security, connecting with pleasure and expansive possibilities. Dear listener, this is my favorite chapter, right? So we have done all that work in the body. We have explored set and setting. We have communicated our desires with our partners. And now it's important to reconnect with what makes the journey all worthwhile, right? The pleasure, the possibilities. And so we often can get so lost in the flood of emotions as we're stretching into this new psychedelic paradigm that it's hard to connect with the embodiment of confidence and pleasure and security. So to find that balance, we want to be intentional about setting aside time to connect with a future of radical joy. So what do you see in this world of pleasure and how does your body feel living into the dream? Do you remember that you are the author of your life story You get to write a story of empowerment, radical ecstasy, and deeply intimate relationships. So take time to clearly envision a world where you embody the highest form of love and connection that is possible. Set an intention to hold on to you as you ride the waves of discomfort and growth towards this new world. 
Remember the important value systems rooted in the foundation of your vision. And be sure to affirm both yourself and your community as you navigate your expansive journey of liberated love. So first, let's really connect with envisioning. So number one, reconnect. So envisioning a world of radical joy can be exceptionally difficult when we are flooded with a complex range of challenging emotions. How are you supposed to be happy when you're activated like that, right? It can be helpful to first start with reconnecting with previous experiences of security, pleasure, and love. So as you answer the questions below, try to recall the memories as vividly as possible and reconnect with the emotions you experienced in your body. To do so, it can be helpful to write out your responses in full detail in a journal or take time sharing your responses with a lover. So we're gonna go through six different prompts, right? If you are grabbing pen and paper, now is the time. All right, so the first question, what is the most recent pleasurable experience you shared with your partner or community? What was going on? What made it pleasurable? Two, can you pull up recent photos, videos, erotic play videos are a fan favorite, <laughs> messages, or past relationship reflection, right, which is the practice I do with all of my partners and is on my website, right, this monthly reflection practice with prompts to feel connected to your partner. Three, recall a time where your partner demonstrated that they cared for you. What did they do to demonstrate this? How did it feel to receive this love? Four, recall a time where your partner demonstrated that they are trustworthy and reliable. What did they do to demonstrate this? How did it feel to know you can trust them? Five, recall a time where your partner demonstrated that they considered your needs in their actions while they were away from you. What did they do to demonstrate this? How did this security feel? And six, recall a time where your partner demonstrated that they are committed to building a future with you. What did they do to demonstrate this? How does it feel to recall that continued commitment in the here and the now? So after reflecting on these questions, I want to invite you to pause and draw your focus to your body. What sensations do you notice? Where are you noticing these feelings in the body? Do your best to just stay present with the feelings for a moment. And now take a deep breath and try to connect even deeper to those feelings in the body really pulling them into your heart. Number two, radical dreams. Imagine a reality of abundance where all of your biggest hopes and dreams of expansive relating and erotic intimacy came true. Create space for yourself to dream without judgment or limitation. So we'll go through a little guided meditation here to connect with your radical dreams. So take a moment to find a comfortable position and find a space where you can dedicate time to focus. Maybe there are dim lights or soft music you would like to set to create a calm and creative atmosphere. And then once you're ready, close your eyes and take a few deep breaths. Centering yourself and connecting with your body. 
and then envision your world of expansive relating and pleasure. Follow your intuition and curiosity by letting the imagery unfold naturally. What do you see? Who is with you? Where are you? Take the time to really describe the surroundings, the people involved, the significant details of this vision. What do you hear? Are there sounds of laughter or music, ecstasy or nature? What do you feel? Notice the sensations in your body as you envision yourself in this world. Are there feelings of warmth, connection, or excitement? Are there any scents or taste present in this environment? What pleasures are you experiencing? Visualize a moment of deep connection and intimacy with your partners. What does this connection look like and feel like? How does it contribute to your pleasure? And visualize a moment of deep connection and intimacy with your metamor. What does this connection look like and feel like? How does this security contribute to your pleasure? And finally, imagine yourself surrounded by loved ones who support and celebrate your expansive relating and liberated love. How does it feel to be embraced by this community? As you close this envisioning practice, take a moment to again connect with and deepen the sensations in the body. Take a couple of rounds of full deep breaths. Let's inhale and exhale. Knowing in your heart that this world is more than possible. Trust that this world can become your reality. And now, finally, we will move into your intention pieces. So first, finding a phrase or a mantra that resonates with you that you want to hold on to, right? We live in a world that has so deeply disconnected us from our pleasure, especially depending on your various intersecting identities. And so there will continue to be waves of discomfort and challenge as you build your dream reality of expansive relating. I can promise you that. I can promise that in any dynamic, truly, right? Any relationship. In psychedelic journeys, it can be helpful to set an intention to hold on to as your paradigms of existence shift, right? You're hitting that psychedelic space, the drug is impacting you. It's really helpful to have an intention to hold on to. And this intention can be a reminder of where you'd like to dedicate your focus and set your direction towards, right? You can think of your intention kind of like a light in the distance guiding you home, right? While the journey home may be unpredictable and full of challenging twists and turns, your intention can serve as a reminder of where you'd like to head towards on your adventure. So take a moment to think of a short phrase that could encapsulate your intention for expansive relating. If you want to pause and take some time to reflect on it, I want to invite you to do that with the recording now. Otherwise, I'm going to share with you my intention as I move through this world. And 
Whew. My intention is to experience the highest form of expansive love, radical community, and erotic pleasure that is possible in a lifetime. My intention is to also support my partners and community in experiencing their unique vision of this dream, right? Since my partners, they might have a very different vision, right? We're all going to have different visions of what expansive love means. And so that is my intention, right? To experience the highest form of expansive love, radical community, and erotic pleasure that is possible in a lifetime, and then to support my people in experiencing their own version of that. And of course, your intentions can change over the years. Remember, change is the only constant. So continue to adapt your intention to flow with your evolution. And we also want to ground in your values, right? As you're riding the waves of discomfort and growth with our intention in mind, it can be so helpful to have values that you're rooted in during those moments of difficulty, right? They serve as guiding principles that reflect what is most important and meaningful to us in life. They represent the qualities and traits and experiences that we want to cultivate and prioritize in our actions and decisions. So... When we encounter challenges, our values can act as anchors that help us to stay grounded and resilient, guiding us through difficult times with clarity and determination. Choose to act from your values rather than from fear. So I want to invite you to again pause and take some time to identify the values that are important to you. I'm going to share with you mine here. I have a couple that are important as I move through this journey. So one, interconnectedness. Remembering that I am part of an expansive community. I am never alone. May I move with the grace and intentionality, knowing that my actions will impact the individuals around me. I am held in a deep community of love who will support challenge, and grow with me. May I trust that I am loved even in moments of doubt. My sense of self is created by the relationships I choose to build in this life. May I also show up for, serve, and give back to my community. Two, self-governance. Remembering the joy I feel when I am trusted to act in loving consideration of my partners and community, and then granting that same expansive trust to others. Even when I am afraid, may I choose to trust my partners and know that they will consider me in their actions. In our individual freedom, we can come together to collaborate for the greater good of our collective community. Three, pleasure. Remembering that embodying pleasure is a radical act of revolution. May I remember that dismantling the internalization of judgment towards pleasure is going to be uncomfortable. May I remember to not identify myself or attach to these emotions. I can trust that it does get easier to embody pleasure liberation with each little step. There is no final destination. Embodying deeper pleasure is a lifelong journey of expansive adventure. Practice and trust that all is coming. Four, change. Remembering that change is the only constant. With each moment, I am becoming and my relationships are evolving. Rather than holding on to the past or looking to define who I am or what a relationship might be, May I embrace the continual unfolding of my narrative. May I be here in the present moment with all that it is, both the pain and the pleasure. And five, resilience. Remembering that another world is possible. May I remember that building this world will be a long journey of learning, unlearning, and making mistakes. I am not defined by my mistakes, but rather by how I respond to them moving forward. May I remember that another world is possible, deep within my heart, 
as I face judgments from others who do not understand, and as I unpack the internalization of systems of oppression that are so deep within my own psyche. My resilience is found in my expansive community and knowing that I am not alone. And finally, dear listener, I want to close out with affirmations, okay? You deserve them. I deserve them. All of us radical, expansive lovers deserve so many affirmations. And so when we're activated and we're jealous and all those feelings, it can be hard to affirm ourselves, right? And so it can be helpful to think about what you would say to a friend who found themselves in a similar position. So maybe that will get some ideas rolling for you, right? I'll share with you now some of the affirmations that I want to continue to provide for myself and my community as I move through these waves of change. I am worthy of love and I am loved deeply. I am secure in my relationships and trust my partners. I am resilient and can embrace both challenges and change. I trust myself to know I am unique. There is no competition. There is no comparison. I am right here, right now, and I can have everything I dream of with liberated love. I've had to repeat those phrases again and again until I actually felt them in my heart. I've been so terrified and afraid, and I would just repeat these phrases again and again like a mantra. And so... I hope you can take some time to find the phrases that resonate with you, dear listener. May you live into your most radical dreams of erotic connection and intimate relationships. May you know the depth of love that is possible in a lifetime. I am surely living into the reality of my wildest dreams and wishing the same for you, dear listener. And with that, dear listener, please know that I'm sending you all my love and I will see you all next week. If you enjoyed today's episode, then leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast and head on over to modernanarchypodcast.com to get resources and learn more about all the things we talked about on today's episode. I want to thank you for tuning in and I will see you all next week.